Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Megan Donaldson, Alumni Relations Manager here at Trinity Development and Alumni, and you're all very welcome to today's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar, Transforming Disability, How Inclusion Benefits Everyone. I'm delighted to welcome our guest speakers today, who will speak about the life-changing work of the Trinity Center for People with Intellectual Disabilities, the benefits of inclusion in the workplace, and the latest thinking and actions from the corporate world around this issue. Our webinar today will be just under an hour and the talk itself will last around 30 minutes, after which we'll open the floor to audience questions at the end of the discussion. We encourage as much audience interaction as possible, so please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. You're welcome to pop them in as you think of them throughout the webinar. I'd like to note that we are using Zoom generated automatic subtitles today. If you'd like to turn these subtitles on or off, click the CC closed captions button at the bottom of your screen, then click show or hide subtitles. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on our Trinity Alumni YouTube channel. I'd like to start by introducing today's speakers. Marie Devitt is Pathways Coordinator in the Trinity Center for People with Intellectual Disabilities, hereafter referred to as TCPID, in the School of Education here at Trinity. Maria is responsible for building the TCPID Business Partners Network and securing both financial and practical support from the business community. She works closely with the business partners to develop work placements, paid internships, and employment opportunities for students and graduates of the program. David McRedmond was appointed CEO of OnPost in October 2016, whereas he has led the company's transformation program. He is personally driving OnPost's sustainability charter, having positioned five of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals at the center of OnPost's tr business transformation strategy. David was previously CEO of TV3, Managing Director of Aircom Enterprises, Operations Director at Waterstones, and CEO of WH Smith Incorporated. Tara Doyle is the chairperson, chairperson of Matheson. She is also head of Matheson's Asset Management and Investment Funds Department. Tara has served as chair of Matheson's graduate recruitment program since 2002, and is also a member of Matheson's Impactful Business Program Steering Committee. Tara holds an LLB from Trinity College and an LLM in International Business Law from the London School of Economics. Finally, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Hugo McNeil. After graduating from Trinity, Hugo studied at Oxford University before joining Boston Consulting Group in 1985 and Goldman Sachs in 1988. He's always been active in the areas of social justice alongside his international business career, and he has been an ambassador for TCPID for many years. I'll hand you over to Hugo now, who will share a little bit about the work and mission of TCPID. Thanks, Megan, <clears throat> and uh, delighted to be uh, with you today, and thank particularly to be part of this uh, webinar when joined by people who really are leaders in the field of inclusion in, in Ireland. Um, and inclusion has many forms, which we'll cover in the discussion and the Q&A, but we did want to highlight uh, the truly extraordinary work of the Trinity of TCPID, um, and you should be as, as people connected with Trinity or as graduates very proud of it. It's become an inter it was always been assumed that people with intellectual disabilities couldn't go to college. Less than one percent of students with intellectual disabilities do go to college. Less than five percent get permanent employment. We we must change this. We can change this, and the TCPID model has shown how to do it really well by doing a structured course. Uh, with a great program and great teachers, but then the key area is placing them with businesses. Uh, and that's really made a transformational impact on the lives of these young people, their parents, and the companies that have actually they've actually worked with. And a TCPID has become an international leader in, in the field. The course itself is a two-year course of art, science, inclusive practices, including, including human rights. But the key is actually placing the students in internship and full-term employment where they, when, they, when they finish. And that's actually where all of you could, could come in. Uh, simply by providing introductions to your company, simply by being an ambassador, you can help transform because the personal recommendation is, is actually sort of key. Um, and we're gonna show a short video with some of the highlights of some of our students and how their lives have been impacted. And it's, it, it, it's really what's behind the whole inspiration, the transforming lives. And my, one of my favorite stories is a young man called Tomas Murphy. Tomas wouldn't go leave the house before he did the course. He did the course, he was sent to Washington as an ambassador for Trinity. He comes back, he's invited to an Ireland Funds function where a lot of not-for-profit organizations are, and he meets the then Taoiseach Enda Kenny. And as I watched his Sheila, his mother, watching her little boy who would never leave the house, uh, 
comparing notes about Washington with the Taoiseach, Tomas talking at this conference, the Taoiseach talking about being in the White House with President Obama, I thought he was she was going to absolutely explode with pride. And the great thing is that all behind every intern, behind every company that takes on one of our students, and we've gone from four business partners in 2016 to 40, with the latest being AIB and National Lottery coming on board, uh, even during the pandemic. We have great momentum, and you can be fantastic in ambassadors for us just make the introductions we'll do the rest and now we're delighted to sort of look at this brief video which highlights some of our star students as they've gone through they're all stars but you'll know what i mean when you see it the reason why i decided to go with trinity to complete the course was because my sister and my father went to Trinity before and I wanted to prove that I would be able to write the challenge of being in college. I decided to come to college to complete the course to learn about myself and to get a qualification so when I finish college I'll be able to get a job. I wanted to kind of take a bigger step um, because I knew that Trinity would be the one. I wanted to see what it was like to be to kind of travel and to be more independent and to kind of get out of my shell. And... When I went to college, um, I did some workshops and I interviewed at the beginning. I was very happy of the course actually. I wanted to get a job and I wanted to, to challenge myself and to learn new things. I decided to come to Trinity College to learn to see what college, uh, um, college life is really like, um, to learn um, the classes, learn about disability rights, and yeah, so on. In ICANN, I got to use my photography skills because I had that on my CV and it was amazing, amazing experience. I did in Bank of Ireland in my complete world. Um, it was actually brilliant. I enjoyed uh, working on my mentor. I did some Excel and all that and computer skills. I did my work experience at the um, Bank of Ireland. I enjoyed everything being on the computer because I love technology. I love computers and I've always loved technology when I was little. What I enjoyed most of the work placement was with meeting the different teams, like learning what they do and um, how they operate. Uh, learning how to work in a busy environment as well. Do well in my intern and then maybe get a job in the future. It will mean a lot for me uh, to have a job. Thanks to more on the computer, you know, like um, like something every time. I would love to get a job too, yeah. What I'm looking forward to is being able to meet the um, people in the company and be able to show me around and be able to learn more things about their what they do and the, the company in itself. I'm hoping to kind of work in a good company where I can I can be be that part of being professional. Wow, well, that's fantastic. Uh, never stop never get tired of looking at those stories. Are really absolutely fantastic and uh, you can see the impact they're having on those young people and, and also their families as well so we're delighted to join and tara if maybe kick off with you how have you seen the whole attitude towards you know diversity and inclusion change over the sort of the course of your career and where where where, where do you where do you think what what do you think the potential of it is Sure. Well, I mean, you know, we're, we're not going to go into the ancient history that was the beginning of my yeah. career. But, you know, if I if I just look over the last few years, because I think the change has been remarkably sudden. Uh, and we've sort of gone from an attitude of this not being a topic of conversation. It's just not being something that people talked about in the workforce at all to a focus maybe on discrimination and not discriminating. And so almost like a, you know you have to you have to make sure that your policies are not discriminatory and that people have opportunities to really a sense of inclusion and belonging so not just yeah. that you have to not discriminate against people but actually you actively want to have diversity in your workforce 
and you want those people to feel included and you want those people to belong. And I think that sort of dialogue, I mean, it's really in the last five, ten, five years, I would say, that that's really started happening. And it's been so enriching um, as an employer, as somebody working in a firm to actually see that transformation over the past few years. Great. David, you've you've been involved with different companies and you, I've heard you speak on a number of occasions about this and, and on the topic of the true inclusion is one of the big issues for, for corporates and entities also. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, thanks very much. And absolutely delighted and really honoured to be here. Um, I'm a great supporter of uh, TCPID. I think it is, it is, uh, it really is, is groundbreaking work that it does. Um, it's quite simple in business. You know, we, we always say that people are the most important thing, but do we think about it? Um, we, we, we know we have to make connections. Do we know how we do it? For me, it's, it's very straightforward. Diverse views, diverse opinions um, are the essence of good decision-making. Um, we know we make better decisions. All the science is there. All the research is done. The better decisions are made when there are different views in a room. And, uh, and, and it's, it's hard to get there sometimes. Um, so any opportunity to be able to make uh, that room more diverse uh, is an opportunity to be grasped. You know, so you know, in, in, in UMPUS, we've worked very strongly um, on gender, for example, in, in the last few years to eliminate the gender pay gap. And, you know, it's, it's almost laughable, the idea when you see photos now of rooms that are all male. Um, whereas a few years ago, that could have been the norm. Um, and, and likewise, when it comes to different forms of diversity, and diversity can, can come in many different ways. And it comes hugely in terms of reflecting our society. So one of the great things that um, most businesses do is they'll talk about customer obsession or customer focus or, or whatever that may be in terms of how to be better with customers. You cannot be better with customers if you don't understand customers. So our businesses have to reflect the world that we're in. And therefore, for me, the whole issue of inclusion, and particularly, you know, inclusion and disability, because disability is very broad, you know, and, and, and it encompasses many, many people uh, in our society, encompasses many people within our own families, amongst our own friends. Well, how can I make sure that in Unpust, that we're really being a world-class organization in terms of having a customer obsession if I don't understand how people with disability work with an organization. So I think the whole area has, has really developed whereby it's no longer coming from what is undoubtedly an issue of social justice, but is actually coming from an area that actually has real purpose and intent to have better businesses and better engagement with the society that we're in. Yeah, excellent. Uh, absolutely. Marie, you've been interacting from the other sort of side with, with businesses like Compost, like Matheson, like, like many others. How, how have you seen the evolution since the period when you've been playing this very important role and where do you think it's, where do you think it's going? Thanks, Hugh. Yes, I mean, I've, I've been privileged enough to work in this role for the past six years. And in that, in that time, I've seen a huge change in how companies are, I guess, dealing with the issue of inclusion and, and how they can make that happen within their organisations. Obviously, I know David well. We've uh, we've two of our graduates working in on post at the moment, and you know, both completely different um, individuals and both placed within completely different types of roles. And I think that's what's key is that you know it's a very individualised um, approach that we take with inclusion because everybody's different we're all different we all have our strengths we all have our weaknesses and what we try and do is work with the companies to focus on the ability of our young people and focus on what they can do how can we support them to you know to be able to achieve their goals and you know uh, obviously as i said i'm privileged to work with an amazing team in the tcpid and um we work with our students over a period of two years where they do their course but then built on that, we have the, the excellent partnerships with businesses and central to our work, I suppose, is occupational therapy, um, which is core to 
from the minute the student starts in Trinity Core to helping them with the trans various transitions that they go through. And uh, my colleague Barbara is central to ensuring that the, the students and the graduates get to understand what their rights are, what they need to be able to succeed. And then we work with the businesses as well to see what do they need to adapt in order to support everybody. And it is across the board that, you know, as Tara said, people should be made to feel they belong and, you know, that they feel valued and that, you know, there is a role for everyone. And it's just a question of supporting every individual with every ability to, to be the best that they can be and to succeed um, in whatever role uh, they, they they want to to move into. And what would you say to, and, uh, and for, for all of you, and Marie, you'd, you'd be dealing with it up front, with some companies might be hesitant. They kind of, when they think intellectual disability, is there a health issue? Is there something that I, I, I like the concept, but I'm, I'm not really sure. Am I getting into an area that I don't really understand? Maybe, maybe talk to that. Mm -hmm. Tara and David, from your sort of point of view, how you would address that. I know Marie, as you've just described, you spent all, an awful lot of time getting the match right, getting the fit right, getting it, getting it just to work. Um, but that's, it's very important that we don't have things go wrong, principally for the student and their family, yeah. but also for the sort of the, the ambition and the, to, to really achieve what this can achieve. Absolutely. And just, just on that, obviously we want every um, internship to be a success and for everyone, business and graduate to be, to feel that you know, they have everything they need in order to succeed. And there is a nervousness every single time. There's a nervousness from every company um, of, you know, what if I say something wrong? What if I do something wrong? You know, the reality is you, you can't. It's, it's, all about, it's all about being kind, being patient, being welcoming, you know, making someone feel valued and making someone feel part of a team. So, you know, we, we obviously from the TCPID, and I, I can only talk to, you know, what, what we do with companies, but it's the same across the board for every uh, new hire that joins a company. Um, it is about sort of looking at the person, you know, don't worry too much about the disability, worry, worry, you know, worry about the abilities and about the person and about their likes and their dislikes and, you know, how you can kind of, bring them into the team and and you know it really does enrich the team once they are in it and you know I know we've seen that obviously in Ampost with you David um you know uh, with our two graduates so valued and so welcomed in uh, in there yeah I, and and uh, absolutely and uh, you know they they do great work and and that's important to recognize that yes they're valued but they do great work for us and uh, what I say to companies in answering your question, Hugo, is, is actually, it's not so much about the company, it's about the people in the company. And I never cease to be amazed, whether it was here or whether when I was in my TV three days or whatever, about how individual employees within the company, whether it's the manager of whoever is coming into the company, of the person with disability, about their manager or or typically it's their colleagues somewhere, you know, either side of them, that they take the responsibility and that they then develop that relationship with the person who has the disability. And as Mary keeps emphasizing, it's not about the person's disability, it's about their ability. And, you know, if you were to look, by the way, at any survey today as to what is the number one or two business issue uh, in this country, and it's the search for talent. Absolutely, it is on fire at the moment. It's so hard to find talent. And, and to look at these people as people with talent, and you'll find that the employees will actually do that work for you. So this isn't about a board or this isn't about top down. This is about actually that connection that is made, a very human connection that, that gets that to work. And, and as Mary says, it can be transformative in a particular team. And I know from the teams who've worked with, with people where, who've come from TCPID or elsewhere, we've taken people from elsewhere, is what they always say is it just, it just makes us more human. It makes us think in a different way. It makes us look at the world slightly differently, not hugely differently, but slightly differently. And those tipping points um, can really add value. And I mean, I would echo everything David's been saying. I, I think that concept of talent is a really important one to focus on and, and the concept of ability that Marie talked about. They, they're the words we really should be using and, and talking about because I think sometimes we can 
think about intellectual disability and just categorize everybody into one amorphous lump of people with intellectual disabilities, as opposed to looking at this as a range of different challenges and behaviors and abilities that people have and the different roles we have in our companies and our firms and the ability of people to actually perform those functions and roles. And so it is very much, as David said, it's all about looking for talent. It's all about more diverse pools of talent. And it's all about being open and welcome to people of all abilities and actually focusing, as we say, on, on the ability and not being limited by what you might perceive to be an intellectual disability when you maybe don't have a full understanding of what that involves. Yeah, there's an interesting question from a Jessica Dully saying, would there anyone prepared to share any misconceptions that companies might have before they took this on to give comfort to, to companies that haven't actually and maybe, maybe sort of still hesitant? Sure, I guess I'd, I'd be happy to share one there, Hugh. I remember um, it's interesting when David was talking earlier about, you know, diversity and talking about one of the entry points from POST was gender diversity. And that certainly as a law firm, that would have been our first real you know, tipping or dipping the toe into the waters of diversity was trying to address, you know, gender, gender challenges. Um, and then we became involved with the Irish Centre for um, Equality and Diversity. And, and they challenged us to think about all the different forms of discrimination and to think about all the different types of diversity and what we were doing to promote all of them. And one of them that they would have focused on was intellectual disability. And a senior partner at the time would have said, Oh, but there's a risk issue there. I, I can't have somebody who has a learning disorder working as a lawyer in my firm because they could cause risk issues for my client. And I was like, don't be ridiculous. One of your senior partners has that exact disorder and he's one of the best people in the building. And so sometimes it can actually be about not recognizing that you know, something like, say, dyslexia or dyspraxia doesn't disqualify you from being a lawyer. It just means actually you've had to overcome a lot more to be as talented as you are to have achieved the results you achieved in college and to be as good a lawyer as you have. And that's the sort of person you want on your team. Yeah, I would say actually, um, it's a really interesting point that Tara and you know, Mary, you're great to highlight the, the, the two graduates we have from TCPID, uh, Neve and Barry working with us. But you know, 5% of our workforce have a disability. 5% represents nearly 500 people in Unpust. Now, so maybe a misconception is that, that it's unusual, you know? Maybe it's a, 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 and rather than actually saying, well, actually, we, we all actually have our own abilities and disabilities, we all have our own issues. And yes, of course, we have to recognize that some people have more issues than others and some are more challenging. And yes, you deal with that, but it is a range and it's not it's not a uniqueness or, or, or sorry, it, it is a uniqueness. It's a uniqueness everyone has. So I think it's quite important to see it in that way. And again, I'd go back if you it, it's sometimes useful to look back and say, you know, it's it's almost laughable that we consider gender to be a diversity. that We consider having women to be a diversity. It's just it's laughable there just in the same way as we consider, for example, um, uh, uh, LGBT as being unusual or being really strange in our society. These things aren't strange anymore, but they were strange at one time. They were very rare at one time. We didn't know it at one time. And so what we see is an evolution of the workplace and an evolution of, of um, the working population and, and these things then normalize. So maybe that's the best way I could, could answer that question around a misconception. It's the misconception that this is unusual. Yeah. Actually, Marie, actually I have one as well, yeah. Yeah, and the question, Marie, to take from Saifi. Oh, yeah. When TCP ID started this course for people with disabilities, how impactful did you think it would become for people who didn't think they would be able to go to college? You have you've, have some... Oh, Sive. I mean, Sive was one of the stars of that video a few minutes ago, and uh, yeah. I'm delighted she's on the webinar now. Exactly. Um, you know, it has it has surpassed all of our expectations of, of the impact that it would have. Um, you know, these these young people that um, come to study with us in Trinity have often been overlooked um, in you know, in, in many ways and the kind of the expectations for people with intellectual disabilities in school have been very low, very low expectations of what they can do. You know, we've one graduate who's, who told us very recently that when all her friends in school were 
uh, putting their CEO um, list together to apply for college. They have loads of options. And she was given one option, and that was to do rehabilitative training. And that was her only option that the, the school suggested for her. So what we're seeing now is there's a huge change in attitudes. And that's really, if we, if we manage to change attitudes, then we have done our job. So, you know, we're changing attitudes to what these amazing young people can do and what they will achieve and the impact that, that has, not just on, on uh, people like Sai herself, um, but also on families and on their peers and on people, you know, growing up, be, you know, behind them and what they will um, aspire to. And the, the change is just unbelievable we, you know we're incredibly proud of all of our graduates but we're also incredibly proud of what we are seeing out in um, companies that we work with and also wider society as well because the attitudes are changing and the 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 view now is that people of all abilities are capable of so many things and so many jobs and the doors are opening and the world is changing and the future is so bright for Sive and for her fellow classmates and for, you know, the, the many, many students who will follow behind. And it's just, it, it's, it's really, a, we're at a pivotal moment because things are really changing. And, you know, thanks to, to everyone really running with this and including people within their companies, uh, it, it's getting better and better every day. Yeah. Um, so in this, Thing, the latest, if, if we kind of, when we were thinking about putting together this, this, this webinar, one of the things, what were the latest, um, you know, thinking, what are examples of successes that you've seen? Where do you think if we're having this conversation, you know, in two or three years time, where, where would you, what, what would you like to be um, feeding, feeding back to us um, within your, you know, within your own organization and how, how are the ways this is going to, is going to happen? You know, I think the, uh, I, as I, I, I keep using this word again about me normalizing um, what, what, what a workplace is. And, and of course, a workplace now, now we're entering a really interesting phase, whereas, of course, our workplace is, is, is anywhere. Our workplace yeah. is our home. And that actually creates, again, even more possibilities. Something else that creates possibilities and, and part of actually that workplacing is, is technology. Um, I, I put up a video recently in, of uh, robots that we're using, uh, that we're testing in, in our mail centers. And these robots can move all the goods around. It's a fabulous, it, it looks fantastic. And somebody's saying, oh, this is terrible because this is removing good jobs and everything. We're so committed to decent work and committed to good, good jobs. And we work really closely with our unions, for example, uh, on that and making sure there's decent work, making sure there's good jobs. But the nature of that work is changing so that, you know, if we don't need people to move the stuff around a warehouse, we can have people doing more value add jobs. If people who, who have particular abilities, i.e. they might have a disability in one area, but they have particular ability, let's say they're highly numerous, we can use them doing work that, you know, right at the moment, data is a massive issue. And we need to do big research. I had a meeting this morning with my management board and we're talking about needing to do research amongst um, small and medium businesses in the UK as to how they can cope with customs. And we need to do calls. We find out what the issues are. Well, you know, you can have somebody who can have a physical disability doing a lot of calls. You can have, you know, so <laughs> you can have somebody with an intellectual disability doing other elements of, of work. And, and that's the whole point of this. But all the time, it's about finding where is their ability, how can we access that talent and how can we use it? So I, I think that's really, if the, the more we see that the nature of work is changing, that we can really target where the value add is. I think that's, that's what, what I'd like to see. Hugo, I, I guess if you're asking me where, where would I like things to be in a couple of years time, I mean, I think it would be that we would get beyond all of this being anecdotal, and having it be more mainstream. Yeah. Um, and I think, I know that David has been doing pioneering work in terms of, you know, measuring um, how well on Plus you're doing versus different diversity matrix. And it can be very challenging with intellectual disabilities to really to build up data on, on how well you're doing. 
because it is something that is quite personal and private to the individual. Uh, they're not required to disclose their disabilities to you, and they may not feel that they that it would be welcome for them to do it. Yeah. You know, to be kind of creating an environment where you can actually gather that information and people are, are comfortable sharing it because the act of measuring anything changes it. Uh, and I think that's how we'll achieve real change if we can measure how well we're doing against these matrices. Yeah. Is there an element, we obviously hope from the reason we're doing it is because it's kind of ethically right. It's, it's right. And as David said at the, at the start, that diversity is a good thing within an organization. But do you, do you, do you think without being sort of negative that there's a, the, or, or, or uh, you know, inappropriate. There, there's a benefit to the company, to the brand, to a company's brand. A couple of the when we were talking about this beforehand, is there is there a brand, sort of an internal brand with its employees, or external brand for from with, with its customers, so that something is not just ethically and morally right, but it's actually good business as well. That's I, that's my essential point, Hugo. Is this is good business? I mean, I'm not here to you know. Yes, in Unpass because we're we're owned by the government and we're semi-state, and therefore you know we have probably a, a, a stronger level of of a public purpose. So any private sector company I've been in one my life's been private sector. They have great sense of public purpose too. Um, but yeah, it has to work. It has to be efficient. It has to be good business. So, you know, where does it translate through? For example, you know, we've had to make difficult decisions in Unpost around putting up prices because we need to, to do that to provide a service in every community in the country and not just provide service in the cities or, or whatever. To do that, you know, customers, communities, your society has to see you've been of value and saying, well, we're not prepared to pay a higher price. But if they perceive that the company is adding value, then they'll say, yeah, we'll be prepared to pay, you know, not a lot more because people are hard pressed financially, but they might say, yeah, one or two percent more, we'll pay that. That can have a massive effect in terms of the company's finance. So I think, I think there can be, and, and there's nothing wrong with saying that, it, you know, some of these things are done to, to, to absolutely improve the brand, but improve, all, all a brand is, is a kind of promise and, and, and almost a contract with your customers. And if your customers want your company to be in a certain way, and I think in Ireland, and I think it's really important this, that in Ireland, I think people do want companies to be good. They want companies to behave well. They want companies to be positive for society. And I think that's something that, you know, Ireland actually can really, we can really take a, take a lead on this not to an extent of being uncompetitive, but this doesn't make you uncompetitive. You're getting better talent. And actually, you know, to follow on exactly what you're saying, David, on, on uh, you know, the importance of recruiting new talent to your company, that if you are seen and perceived to be a company that is inclusive and that has good values and that treats your people well and welcomes all abilities, then you will attract the talent. But not only that, you will retain retain your valuable talent to stay with you because they will believe in what you're doing. And I think, you know, obviously companies are, you know, it's important to make money and to be successful in that way. But I think it's also really important to have, you know, to have really strong values within the organization that will keep your team with you for the long term. And ultimately, you know, that's that's what um what is important. A couple of our partners, a couple of our partners had uh put their people on the front desk or people on the front desk who, who had kind of clearly with a disability and it, it, they said it was a remarkable feedback that we got not just from our customers who came in and said this is the first interaction I have with your company but actually from the employees saying this is what this is this is the values that our our company kind of embodies I mean, yeah, got, employees I, now are interviewing us. I mean, let's be clear about this <laughs> talent issue. You know, I'm yeah. no longer interviewing talent that you know they interview us. And particularly, you know, it's a Gen, Gen Z or Gen Z thing is to say, what are your values? I may have been asked that more and more when I've been interviewed. What are your values? What are you doing on sustainability? And to us, this is all about sustainability, by the way. It's about, you know, long term and long term view in society. What, what are you doing? And, and, you know, you have to be able to answer it and say that this is what you stand for. So to attract the best talent, you, you, you have to have those values. And Hugo, I'm having the exact same experience. Megan mentioned in my introduction that I've been doing graduate recruitment at Matheson for over 20 years. And I used to tell people, I used to attract people by telling them that I acted for your former employer, Goldman Sachs. 
And now they don't want to talk about that at all. When they come in for, for you know, interview, they want to hear about your values. Yeah. You know, and they want to see that your values align with theirs. And talking about your inclusivity as an employer is really important to them. Yeah. They're only half of the picture for me. The other half is, is clients. I need to have clients as well. And increasingly, they're asking me the exact same questions. I mean, I have one client, I have, a, I have a quarterly meeting with them where they want to talk about the fees I've charged them, but they want to spend the rest of the time actually examining the data I have on what we're doing around inclusion, because that's just as important to them as whether we're talented lawyers or you know, whether we're charging them the right fees or not. So it's part of the discussion with all of the people you're dealing with. It's, it goes back to what David was saying earlier. People want to see themselves in your firm. If they're your customers, they want to see that you're the same as them. Yeah. And, and one of the things and we've, we've seen is how transformational it can be for the students, for their families um, and for, for, for companies that we're really keen to take this model sort of across the country. I mean, it's, it's, it's very well developed in Trinity. This is not one upmanship for Trinity. There's, it's, it's done for in some other institutions to a sort of a greater or lesser extent. But in some of our bigger institutions, there, there isn't a similar practice. And what we want to do is to take this outside, the, beyond the walls of Trinity, Get other, share our best practice with, with other educational institutions, share the business partner model. And then we can be really, you know, phenomenal because like we have 20 students. I mean, it's, we've 10 in each year. Could we have a bit more? Maybe a little bit more, but if, as Marie would say, you, you'll dilute it. So the, the big, the big ch- ch- challenge is to get more educational institutions to do this because then that's where we get the sort of the leverage. It, it, this model works. It's, it's worked into, it's, you know, we're so passionate about it. But that we're really, and so anybody who's listening today who's you know connected into different universities and some kind of you know companies are connected into universities for whatever, or um, you know, is it's is we would be saying, you know, advocate with that, just as we would ask you to advocate it within your own companies and say, would you take a meeting with TCPID? Do you have a do you have a and we actually interestingly have got a uh, a question from Fiona Whelan. Have other universities outside Ireland approached TCPID to learn and copy from this? Coming from a UK higher education background, I feel this is something that many other universities could and should be modeling. And the answer is that it's very varied. I mean, when we got an award from the Essel Foundation, the Zero Project, about to reduce all barriers around disabilities. And one of the interesting thing on seeing the video of, of companies around the world, of these projects around the world was how advanced the Trinity program was. A lot of the program was very basic, was secondhand clothes or bookshops, all of which is fine if that's the if that's the matches the capability of the student. But we've seen so many of our students, and you've seen them as, as employers, are capable of, of, of a great deal more. And we want to match that, just as the, just as the way we want to match for everyone um, uh, in the uh, in, in, in society in, in general. So I think there's a, it's great that you're telling the stories and I would encourage. Um, and David, what do, you, what do you see looking at sort of the corporate, you know, the, the landscape around h- how ambitious would, do you think this, this, this can be? Oh, look, I think, I, I think anybody in, in uh, the corporate world today has seen how much the world is changing. And, you know, COVID has, pandemic has taught us that actually, Actually, we can cope with change, and things can change an awful lot. Um, and and we also all feel that war for talent, and that need to to be able to reflect the values that Tara is talking about when she's interviewing grads, etc. You know, we need to be able to do that. Um, so uh, so I, I I don't think that there's there's going to be a resistance. There are practical issues. Um, there's issues of measurement, as Tara says, you know, what are the targets? Uh, is government clear about what companies should be doing? I think there are competitive issues. I think there's issues with, um, you know, I've, I have a particular prejudice about uh, gig economy. I'm very anti-gig economy where people don't recognize people as employees, but, and therefore don't have to pay pensions, don't pay sick pay, don't do any of those things. And they end up with a competitive advantage. And, you know, I think there is an extreme version of capitalism. Um, uh, it's probably a bit unfair to call it the American model, but some of it is come from there. Some of it has been in the UK. We've seen the political ramifications of that, potentially with Brexit, potentially with disaffected populations, because, because um, just companies were behaving in a way that was all about uh, extreme profit. 
So, you know, I think the world has moved on from that. And, and I think it's much more nuanced now. I think investors are much more interested. I mean, it's funny, Tara was talking about customers saying it to her. We know, I know in my private sector companies I'm involved in, that investors need. So, for example, in climate change, we know that, that the biggest investment firms in the world require you to have certain ESG standards. Um, and ESG is also part of this. You know, how do you have a sustainable world? So the whole framing and the whole prism through which the corporate world is viewing itself has changed. And that, I think, makes it more open and more likely to embrace uh, programs such as TCPID. But it's not just TCPID. As I say, it's all forms of diversity, all forms of ability. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important what we're seeing now is that obviously with the, the pandemic and people working from home and having lots of different challenges to to be to allow them to continue to work, um, you know, with childcare issues and with, you know, uh, various things happening in the background, literally sometimes that, you know, the importance of being able to bring your full self to work and being able to. You know, I think you mentioned earlier, Tara, about disclosing, whether you disclose or don't disclose, that you should be have the confidence now. And I think it is the case. You should have the confidence to be able to disclose whatever you need in order to help you to do your job. And that is across the board. So I think, you know, if in some small way, you know, the, the issue of, of us um, having supporting our, our own grads into the workplace and, and all the the measures we we uh, put in place to support them that it's encouraging other employees as well to be able to maybe come forward with something that they might be having a, a challenge with and and that would help them and you know in some cases it has been the case that working from home um, and working online has been huge help to people um, both our graduates and and you know I know Neve and on post absolutely adores the working from home David <laughs> as well and you know it helps her because it takes some of the anxiety of the travel away um and you know that it helps people to be able as I say to bring their their whole selves and everything that they um that makes them who they are to work so that you're not just a work person you're a full you know fully rounded um, individual with challenges and with a life outside of it that you can and Marie, can, can you really comment on one of the things is are situations where it hasn't worked out where I mean most in the 99 percent mostly it's been a fantastic story but maybe people are watching and kind of thinking well there must have been what, what are the things that, that may go wrong and how do you avoid it and, and David and Tara to any extent please yeah. feel free to comment I mean, I suppose from our point of view, you know, we really we work very closely yeah. all the way through to make sure that if there are issues and sometimes do, things do come up at the beginning of a, a placement or an internship that can be very easily tweaked. But it's all about trust and it's all about communication. So, as I say, myself and my colleague Barbara and, and previously my other colleague, Giara, you know, we would work very, very closely in a full partnership of trust with the business um, to make sure that the business feels comfortable saying to us if there is a problem and that we can resolve it because, you know, there, there is very little that can't be resolved. Um, and, you know, if an internship doesn't turn into a permanent role, that doesn't mean it wasn't a success or that it was a failure. It's a huge learning experience for the individual anyway. And, you know, maybe the fit wasn't perfect. So we, we can tweak that for the next internship. But what's really important is trust and communication and real, real partnership, um, because uh, that is what will make um, this succeed. There's always bumps along the way. That's that's the same in everything, but they're very easily fixed if we can get to them early. I think that would be my message, yeah. Yeah, look, you know, I, 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 I'm going to sound like a broken record when I say, look, here's, here's the normal world. Maybe 20% of employment decisions don't work out. You know, it's it's yeah. um, it, recruiting people, point. appointing people is really hard mm -hmm. um, because people are complicated and, and workers can be complicated and getting matches can be complicated and you don't always get matches. So it's no different, you know, whether it's somebody from TCPID or whether it's somebody from Boston University or something, you know, you're going to get people who don't work out. And, that, and I think to accept that that's a reality um, and and just be open to to, to what happens and, and and what's going to work. You don't have to force things, and and I think you do just have to accept that. Yeah, sometimes things will work better 
sometimes things won't work so well and and just move forward with it and again allow particularly allow the employees working closely with other employees allow them to solve you know that's where the that's where the, the solutions work and that's that that's how you get these things to happen one thing i would say that we're going to do is um uh, and and it's it really is not me. It's a brilliant HR officer I have, uh, Eleanor Nash, and she just told me that we're going to do an inclusion survey. Now, I think that's a really interesting idea because an inclusion survey will will tell us so much about our employees that we don't know whether and about this whole issue of disclosure, whether it be anything from from. I mean, we know gender, but do we know ethnicity? Do we know uh, do do we know um, Ability, do we know a whole load of different things about our employees? And actually, the richness of that survey, when I think it will be fed back to the employees, will then say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm one of these, or I'm not one of those, or I might be one of them, or I might be one of the other. And that's the whole point about this, that, that, that it could be, uh, you know, everybody's different in their own ways. So, so I, think, I think to see it in that environment or, or in that frame is better rather than saying this is an exception that has to be managed in a different way. Yeah, and just to roll in a couple of couple of questions, which we had a lot of questions. Is there an economic return or is inclusivity just a social cost? Another question, I'll, I'll roll up a, a couple of them before we come back to you. Marie, you might want to come. Does this course enable the young people to also learn alongside those without intellectual disability? Is this in the future plan? Uh, has TCPID worked with partners to su offer supported accommodation for students who live too far away to commute? Um, I don't think we're, that's an area that we, we, we can do, but it seems to be a major barrier for young people in more remote communities. And one of the things that we're trying to do in taking this beyond Trinity is to, is to share with other institutions who are closer uh, than, 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 than Trinity and, and Dublin is. Um, do you want to briefly comment on those? Yeah, Maybe? so um, in relation to the, um, whether they study with students uh, without disabilities, they do. So there is a joint um, module with occupational therapy students in the sports centre that uh, I believe is still um, uh, still ongoing. They also do peer-to-peer um, -peer mentoring, so they're part of that. Um, there's the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project that our students are part of as well. So um, more and more our students are being included in um, lots of projects across Trinity and their voice is very, very important in those projects. Um, and yes, this, the, the joint kind of studying with, um, with other uh, students from other courses is very much to the forefront of what we believe in and we'll, we'll be developing further as well. So it's very enriching for everybody. And it means that, you know, everyone learns from each other and, uh, and has been hugely, hugely valuable. And in fact, we have two occupational therapy students on an internship with us at the moment who studied with some of the, the students uh, in their first year as part of their um, first year programme. So it, it really does enrich the, the Trinity landscape to have all students um, interacting very closely with each other. Tara, what have you? You're, you're, I think on that question about is there an economic return or just, just a social cost? I think that's a really interesting question because I would actually think about it the entirely opposite way, which is that there is a real cost to not being inclusive. You know, there, there's a cost to exclusivity and to reducing your talent pool and reducing your workforce. And it goes back to a word David has used to describe on Plus Business, which is sustainable. You know, to create sustainable businesses, we need to be inclusive. So we haven't, we haven't yet got to the point where we're properly measuring you know, the benefits as opposed to what it would, you know, the, the question implying that there's costs, but there is a real cost to not actually having an inclusive business. And it will be that your business won't be here in five, 10, you know, 20 years time. And also, David, I'm going to steal, or borrow uh, that, that inclusion survey idea, I think. Mm, <laughs> yeah, I think it's been very, very interesting. Um, and, uh, a great program and an interesting email from Sylvia Healy. I would be very interested in hearing more about how to roll out the TCP ID program to TU Dublin. I'm currently trying to develop a program for people with ID in the Tala campus, but we'd love to talk to you about it. And we'd love to talk to institutions all around the country and put every, all our learning uh, at, your, um, at your disposal as well. Um, 
I think we, and some lovely comments, and thank you that we haven't been able to get to all the Q&A, but some lovely comments about their personal experiences of people with intellectual disabilities and how the lives of the families have been transformed by them. And so thank you to people who have shared that. It's, it's not just something that we see, but it, it just is, it, is testimony. Um, so um, I think with that, Megan, will I, hand, will I hand back to you and thank everybody who participated in the, in the, in the Q&A and hope, sorry that we couldn't get to all, all the questions, but we wanna make sure we keep you uh, to the time that we promised. Thank thanks very much, Hugo, and uh, thanks very much to all our panelists. We've had some great questions here today. Um, personally, I, I'd like to share a quote from a recent article in the Harvard Business Review uh, that I read over the weekend, and it noted that inclusive businesses are a magnet for talent, have a broader customer base, spur more innovation, and offer a better quality of life for all. And I think today's discussion uh, certainly demonstrated this and highlighted the positive impact of inclusion in, in a company. As both Hugo and Marie have, have mentioned several times today, anyone affiliated with Trinity can be immensely proud of the university's work in this area, particularly that of TCPID. The center has seen a huge increase in the total number of business partners, as Hugo mentioned, and they've gone from four to 40 across a range of industries since 2016, including major financial institutions and law firms. Alumni and friends who'd like to support their work uh, can do so simply by connecting the center to the right people in their companies who can make the decision about becoming a business partner. If you'd like further information about the center or how to connect with them, you can visit www.tcd.ie forward slash TCPID, or you can email Marie directly at devitt, D-E-V-I-T-T-M-A at tcd.ie. And we'll include those details in the email we send around after this webinar. I'd like to thank today's panelists for joining us today to share their thoughts, expertise, and advice. I'd also like to thank my colleagues here at Trinity Development and Alumni for their efforts in putting this webinar together. It's been a real team effort, uh, particularly Gareth Crow and Mark Deering. And of course, a huge thanks to all of you today for joining us and listening and sharing your questions. Our next webinar will air live on Wednesday, the 30th of March, and we'll be joined by the brilliant Roseanne Kenny, Professor of Medical Gerontology here at Trinity, and Principal Investigator of the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. Professor Kenny will explore the new science of living a longer and healthier life, something I'm sure we all want to know more about. Details on how to register for the next webinar will be emailed to you in the coming weeks. If you have any questions or comments regarding this webinar or the work of the Alumni Office in general, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. Thank you again for joining us and until next time, take care. <laughs>